audience, not outside organizations. To find out more, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, November 30th, 2016. I'm John Merritt. Joining me as he does on Wednesdays, Mr. Scott Johnson. Oh, How are you, Scott? Hey, what's going on, Tom Merritt? Here we are doing it again, making Wednesday great again. And I'm thrilled to be here. I have a hat on, so that's good. It means it's winter. We got snow outside. I had to go out and shovel before I came in here. So, didn't get snow outside. Yeah, we did. We got a few inches, right. and it's icy, and we're trying not to kill ourselves. Hey, uh, if you're listening to the audio podcast, ignore the what I'm about to say because it probably won't matter at all to you. But video-wise, uh, we had to jump through some hoops. Turns out uh, Hangouts On Air has been down since last night. So usually we just stream right through my YouTube channel and do that. Uh, instead, uh, we had to scramble around. And through the good graces of Scott Johnson, we're streaming live on his on your Twitch channel. Is that? Uh, no, we're, we're, we're on DiamondClub.tv. Oh, we're on Diamond Club. Okay. Yeah, which is nice because it's sort of the same place a lot of people already sort of went, except the YouTube yeah. thing, I guess. But, you know, listen, we're like, we live in an age, Tom, where we can scrap it together and make a car out of nothing and drive and find more gas if we have to. Oh, it's seriously. Fine. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks to George Hotz. We'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, but but we are we are able to provide. So thank you all. Uh, it's Man, my TV died yesterday. Oh. Best Buy screwed up my new TV order, and I had to call. The pharmacy had a problem with a prescription for my dog. It's, my sister's phone broke. It's one of those weeks. Stuff's not going uh, the way it should for you. We got two dog loos. I don't know if that counts as being part of your little club, but they sent me one, and then Amazon sent me another one for no reason bonus yeah. right yeah. uh well we're going to get to uh, a discussion of netflix updating its android and ios apps to allow offline viewing of some content uh, we're going to talk about that in our main discussion and and just in general what we think we want from video but that's huge news right mm -hmm. like like short version is scott people are super excited that they finally gave in and gave us this option yeah it's something i think we've been asking for for a long time and having taken a recent flight uh and thinking wouldn't it be nice if i had some of my netflix content with me this is a welcome change some would say they're finally following suit with a few other services amazon prime being a good example and we'll we'll talk a bit about what that means for people like me and you in the u.s altis uh, it's a Dutch company, but they own Cablevision and Suddenlink, announced that it will replace coaxial cable with fiber for all its Cablevision and Suddenlink customers. Eventually, it'll take them a while to do that, but it believes the energy savings will justify the expense. So instead of this DOCSIS 3.0 and, oh, we're going to have gigabit over coaxial, the Altis is like, no, we're, we're going to save money if we actually put in fiber. So they're just going to put in fiber. Nice. Well, bring on the fiber. We could always yeah. use more fiber. We could all use a little more fiber. <laughs> uh, now here are some more top stories. Amazon launched a ton of things at its reInvent uh, conference, but uh, launched a new AI platform in particular. Uh, there are three AI services now available through the cloud to developers. One, recognition, spelled with a K, recognizes objects and scenes and images. Amazon claims it can read emotions from facial expressions, tell apart breeds of dogs, uh, all kinds of other stuff. Amazon Polly is what is they're calling their text-to-speech service. It's meant to be more lifelike than your run-of-the-mill text-to-speech. They offer 47 male and female voices in 24 languages. And finally, Lex lets devs make an enemy for Superman. No, it lets <laughs> devs make multi-step conversational applications. It's the same tech that is inside the voice assistant in your Amazon Echo, which I will try not to say and set off your Amazon Echo. Uh, Lex is integrated with Lambda from Amazon Web Services, as well as Facebook's Messenger, Slack, and Twilio. Uh, so you can, you can put this kind of recognition in a chat bot, you could add it with some voice to speech and, and be able to do uh, an Amazon Echo like thing. And you can have it work as a bot in Messenger, Slack, Twilio. And they're not limiting you to just Amazon stuff. That is the best part of this is it doesn't seem to be trying to lock itself into platform specifics. Um, that is sometimes the fear when cool technology is coming out of any particular company. No one expects Apple to put Siri on other devices, for example. But uh, both Google and Amazon seem to be taking the track that might be better if we are building technologies that others could use, integrate, and um, have, you know, as, as, a, as sort of a larger product base. That probably just means the technology itself will get better with greater use cases. So I'm, I'm sort of all for this. And I really like the name Lex. And it does make me want to say, 
That's what you think, super fools. But I won't. I, you know, a lot of people think Jeff Bezos may be secretly evil. So uh, who knows? I, I do think Amazon has been trying to jump up and down and say, hey, don't give Google and IBM all the credit uh, Facebook for for machine learning and artificial intelligence. We've been doing this for a long time, and they have, uh, but they just haven't had a lot of public facing presence of it. So this is a step towards that. Sure. Uh, YouTube announced today. Oh wait, we missed well, the well, same. Yeah, yeah, tell yeah, me about on. that. One last thing before we move on to that YouTube story. Yeah. Uh, I, I have to mention this. I know Amazon announced like five dollar virtual private servers per month and all this other stuff, but they announced. AWS snowmobile, which uses an 18 wheel truck and a shipping container to transfer up to 100 petabytes of data. The truck pulls up to your data center, transfers the data through a switch and then rolls on out <laughs> to whatever the closest Amazon data center is and puts your data in the cloud. Uh, this for anybody who doesn't know, this sounds crazy for people who deal with large amounts of data center. They're like, yeah, you know, shipping data actually isn't that unusual. So this is a good service, especially if they're getting into freight hauling and things like that. But the crazy part was when they rolled the 18 wheeler on stage at reInvent. Yeah. And called it the AWS snowmobile. Also, um, think about it. A hundred petabytes of data would take, even with the best of pipes, a very long time to move around the internet, especially secure data or data you want to make sure is, you know, as incognito as possible. I think this is a perfectly fine way to do this. So yeah. very cool. YouTube announced today it supports 4K live streaming at 60 frames per second. That's four plus K, by the way. So a little, a little bit more. Uh, and the standard or sorry, as standard for 360 degree video, YouTube added 4K HDR support a few weeks ago. YouTube will live stream the Game Awards in 4K December 1st at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. It's the second Jeff Keighley uh, article of today, by the way. We'll get to the yeah, other one right. later. But, uh, First of two. Yeah, that, that makes sense. They, they've sort of led the way in higher definition streaming. Why not now? Yeah, uh, it, it's interesting to me that we, we need them to step down, right? They already did 4K HDR, but if I'm a streamer yeah. who has a rig with OBS and I just stream games... I likely stream it on Twitch anyway, uh, but I probably don't have it set up to stream in HDR. So I needed something like this uh, to be able to do more 4K streams. So I think a lot of people are excited about this. And as more and more people are getting 4K televisions, uh, they'll want to watch 4K TV experiences. I, you know, I don't know how how great a 4K stream of a video game on YouTube or Twitch would be compared to 1080 if it's not HDR enhanced. That is absolutely a, a, a point of contention with a lot of people about this. Um, is it is it even worth the bandwidth it takes currently to take a 4K stream? And there are plenty of rigs that can do 4K. Um, I can stream at 4K if I want to, but I choose not to, and I go 1080p, not because my pipe can't handle it. It maybe could. I don't know. I actually haven't tried all that hard to see if I could get this going, but I don't think end users are getting that much benefit out of it. I mean, it's what is 4K on a, on a web page? versus on someone's TV, versus on somebody's mobile device. If it's the same stream going out to those three different use cases, what, is, what even is 4K and what benefit are they getting? The guy on the phone is not getting really any more benefit. He's getting more benefit from the 60 frames per second than he is yeah, yeah. the 4K part. Um, so, so I'm well, still... And the 360 yeah. degree video part mm -hmm. uh, benefits from the 4K. Mm -hmm. And again, there's a lot of contention about how useful 360 degree video is but but if you're somebody who's excited about that sort of thing then yeah they, these are going to be better streams and there'll be more of them yep researchers at checkpoint software technology say they've discovered malware that they're calling gooligan like gilligan meets google uh which has compromised more than 1 million google accounts the malware is found in more than 86 apps from third party android marketplaces so first off if you've never installed anything on your Android phone outside of the Google Play Store, you're not vulnerable to this right now. There's nothing in the Google Play Store. This is when you went to a third-party marketplace and installed something, or you clicked on a link, you got fished and accidentally installed something. If you get one of these apps, uh, it can gain root access on your device, running anything from Android ice cream sandwich up to lollipop. So if you're if you're on Marshmallow or Nougat, you shouldn't be vulnerable to this as well. Google says there's no evidence of data being accessed from the compromised accounts, and it's using something they call Verify Apps to push alerts when it notices an infected device to say, hey, folks, you, you need to update, you need to patch, 
Uh, you need to get on a better operating system. Users can visit gooligan.checkpoint.com, where Checkpoint is letting you look up an email address, see if your account is on the list of compromised accounts that they've discovered. If so, you're going to need to do a clean install of Android, and passwords will need to be changed on your Google account. Have you gotten any anecdotal, I don't know, community tweeting or emailing or anything saying, oh, this was me, I'm my phone's been compromised, I have to reinstall. I haven't, no, yeah. I haven't seen anything like that mm. yet. Well, I like this kind of stuff. I like it when uh, there's third-party uh, companies, organizations, whatever it may be, whenever they come forward and go, found a big hole, fellas, time to, to lock that down, and, and they let uh, everybody know from... You know those who are putting Google out and, and that, or excuse me, Android out all the way down to common users who may not have upgraded their phones. So I think this is a a healthy thing for that ecosystem. Certainly, uh, good the, thing to know, folks. It is a good thing. Good things. The more you know, really, the more. Yeah, I'm not going to sing it. The Internet Archive. Oh wait, I take it back. I'm starting over here. No, this is right. The Internet Archive, which aims to be the Internet's library and is most famous for, wait for it, the Wayback Machine. Quiet you. Uh, that lets you view web pages as they were in years past. You can go look at my ancient web comic as it looked in 2003 and be horribly embarrassed by what I thought was good design. Uh, they plan to create a full back of, uh, backup of its backup. So a backup of a backup, an inception backup uh, of the Internet in Canada. It cited protection against things like earthquakes, legal challenges, or institutional failure as reasons in, uh, that it seeks for this kind of redundancy. Archive.org is nonprofit, of course, and is soliciting a donation to fund the effort. Um, I rely on Archive.org nearly daily, and I feel good about uh, redundancy in general. Uh, Canada's right there. Why not? Yeah, I, the motherboard uh, headline on this is talking about President-elect Trump. Uh, a lot of people are saying it's because of that. Maybe it is. But whether it's because of the president or not, the idea of archive.org having a backup in a separate area. In fact, Canada, I mean, I think they're doing Canada because that's probably the most affordable to begin with. Mm -hmm. But they should have one in Asia. They should have one in Africa. Like, put this thing up in orbit. You know, like, if you can if you can make it happen, you, sh you should make sure to have redundant backups because this is in San Francisco earthquake zone. Uh, there could be some sort of power grid failure uh, that that could corrupt data and destroy this. And if your principle, as the Internet Archives is, is to preserve the history of the Internet, uh, the way a library preserves the history of our literature and, and more, then you you need to have these backups no matter what. Yeah, I mean, preservation comes in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And this is really them just following advice we should all be taking about our data. Uh, data is vulnerable to all sorts of things. And to uh, best protect yourself, you ought to have it backed up someplace, maybe multiple places. So I wouldn't mind seeing a future where Essentially, the archive.org is a big synchronized cloud across multiple mega servers across the world, not unlike the Internet itself, but create the kind of redundancy that means that no matter what happens, there is a record of this. Um, and, and the fact that this is just now happening honestly surprised me a little bit. I would have thought this is something they'd have done a long time ago. They're a nonprofit. They don't have uh, necessarily the, the funds to just plant servers everywhere and come up with a way to back up the Internet as quickly as it does, as efficiently as it does, and do it in so many places. But it's nice uh, It's nice to see they I have mean, a plan. The idea when they started in the 90s of making a copy of the Internet was crazy. Yeah. It was crazy. Yeah. And and yet their Brewster Kale is still going. I'm a huge uh, admirer of this project. We support it. Daily Tech News Show uh, donates money and has for a long time uh, to help this project out because we store episodes of Daily Tech News Show on archive.org, uh, as well as Daily Tech Headlines and lots of other stuff. So I'm, I'm a big supporter of this, and I, and I think, yeah, the distributed storage is, is good for all the reasons we've said. My only remaining question, Scott, mm. will they be using Amazon Snowplow oh. to deliver that data to Canada? <laughs> okay, well, now Canada makes sense. You just need to drive it over there, present the proper yep. papers, and you've got your big 100 petabyte AWS machine. Here's here's the other thing that, that is slightly bugging me about all these headlines. It's just too tempting because it's Canada and because Canada is always the joke when something doesn't go well domestically, whatever it may be, whatever era you're living in, whatever your opinions may be, it's always Canada that people are running to. That's the big joke. You dodge the draft, you go to Canada. You do this, you go to Canada. If that person is elected, I'm going to Canada. So the fact they're doing it in Canada was too tempting for too many journalists. 
and I and I understand, but I also think they should have restrained themselves. That's all. Yeah, uh, if you if you actually read the archive.org posting about this, it doesn't make any notice uh, of of political reasons. It says legal regimes. So in other words, that's more about surveillance than it is any one individual. Like, eh, you know, what if what if people start to put in some some kind of surveillance law or censorship law? Institutional failure is a t separate one in earthquakes. So yeah, I mean, let's let's. There's lots of good reasons to do this. This is true. Uh, another bold move came from George Hotz. Sh he shut down his self-driving car platform, Comma.ai, back in October. We talked about that. Uh, he was starting to get pressure from regulatory agencies. He said he he didn't feel like he could comply with all of this regulatory pressure, so he shut it down. But he hasn't closed the company. Instead, he has put out his software and his hardware designs as open source. Uh, they are all posted to GitHub under the MIT license. That's an open source license. Hot held a press conference in San Francisco pitching the open pilot software as an alternative to Tesla's autopilot said that using OpenPilot in combination with his Comma Neo hardware design uh, would give you almost the same functionality as Tesla's Autopilot 7. The platform right now is limited. It only works on Honda Civics or some Acuras. The operating system you have to use to make the Neo hardware work only runs on a OnePlus 3 phone uh, <laughs> because that was the only one open enough for Hots to be able to do what he wanted. But Hots is hoping that hobbyists and researchers will push the tech forward, and he thinks Kama can make money by owning the network of self-driving cars. He's, he's, he's comparing it to Android. I love this, but I'm a little terrified by it. By, and this is, okay, so here's Scott. Let me go down a little hole, and you can pull me out. You can throw me a rope, all right? My all right. thinking is I get the Hots open source self-driving car code right yeah and like a lot of people do with natural gas cars and that sort of thing they take their existing car and they retrofit it because they can do it themselves it's very diy and it's um you know all the instructions are there you know what you have to get and you do what you have to do the idea of people just regular folks like me and you rather than engineers and trained professionals making our cars self-driving that may not be what this suggests but this is where my head is mm -hmm. um just seems a little precarious that's all just seems like a little on the edge there you know i don't know if i should be <laughs> i don't know if i should be allowing me or perhaps we need things in place that make sure i've done the job i need to so that my car is as safe as possible while autonomously driving on busy roads well look this is like saying i don't know if i if you should just allow anyone to make auto parts because i don't know what i'm doing with my car <laughs> what if i put the wrong part in my brakes and my brakes fail mm -hmm. and i you know and, and i and i crash it's exactly the same thing and hots made a point in his press conference to say this is really for researchers this is really for people to to experiment with this is not for the public this is not an automated car yet this is something that could be implemented for drive assist this is for companies to make and install for people and obviously anybody who works with it is going to have to deal with those regulatory issues that hots didn't want to he's he's kind of pushed that can he's kicked that can that i guess not pushed it like he full-on kicked it down the road <laughs> and said whoever makes a product based on this is going to have to deal with that it. makes sense yeah and from a like if you look at it from the sort of android perspective and all the sort of forked versions that may come out of this it makes perfect sense it may be a great way for smaller car makers to kickstart something uh without literally using something like kickstarter <laughs> so they can you know come up with cool solutions it probably isn't for guys like me to do it on my own i just know some no people. no he made it very clear in his yeah. press conference it's not yeah. it's not for you to just go and try to install like a jailbroken iphone and i get why that comes up in your head because Geo Hots is the guy who did the jailbroken iPhone, right? Mm -hmm, like, mm -hmm. you know, he he has done things that you could do that with. But even back then, even when he was pushing out code to jailbreak an iPhone, it came with the the warrant, uh, you know, the warning that you did this at your own risk. You could break your phone yeah. if you did it wrong. Yeah, he was always careful with, it, careful with that stuff. Yeah. Well, Sony in the news has launched a new PlayStation Communities app. If you're not familiar with what this PlayStation Community is, it's kind of their stab at let's take the PlayStation base and build a social network out of it. This app is now available for Android and iOS. They let players join groups around specific games. Members can post messages and images, join chats, and play multiplayer games together. Um, the big question is, whether or not, for me anyway, whether or not this stuff will translate to Sony getting into mobile games more in the way that Nintendo is. Um, if you ask me, you know, one of the big... 
weird things about 2016 and, and the end of 2015 was this rumor and then confirmation that Nintendo, one of the great independent video game makers of all time, was going to dip their foot in a fairly significant way into mobile, which seemed to go contra, uh, uh, counter to their, uh, their mo- own mobile gaming market. And they're doing that. In fact, on the 15th of next month, we're all getting a Mario game that is exclusive to mobile and that is a single price only uh, thing, not some free to play thing. And we don't know what it's going to be like yet, but it's a big deal. Uh, it marks a big change for them. I've always been surprised given lackluster successes of both PSP and later the Vita, why we haven't heard more from Sony in this regard. Why aren't there a stack of Sony IPs, game IPs, either based on the games they have or whole new properties that are just flooding these app stores? Maybe this is the tip of that spear for them to say, all right, well, we've got the community. It's growing. It's based mostly on PS4 players. But now we've got these people using their phones to kind of keep in touch with it. Maybe that's a great way to sort of expand out. That app's capability would expand. And maybe it would include, you know, something on the, on the go. So that's my only prediction with it. But generally speaking, if you're, if you're into the PlayStation communities, you have a new way to talk to your friends. Yeah. That, no, it's cool. And I like what Sony has been doing where they have come up with more apps that make it easier to use your console, whereas Microsoft tends to try to keep all of this stuff on the console and try to make it easy to use on the console. And and there was a lot of debate over whether that was the best strategy or not. But I know lots of people who say, yeah, I, I really enjoy being able to use that app. It's a lot more convenient. Yep. All right. Thanks to all those who participate in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. As we mentioned, big story of the day, Netflix updated its Android and iOS apps Wednesday to allow downloading of some movies and shows for offline viewing. If a show is available for download, it's going to have a down arrow uh, next to its episode. So you, you won't see it on every single movie and TV show. In fact, a Netflix representative told Recode's Peter Kafka that Disney-owned video will not be available for offline viewing for whatever reason uh, disney didn't say why netflix didn't say why but that not only applies to movies like zootopia but also to marvel stuff disney makes marvel stuff for netflix jessica jones luke cage daredevil you'll notice none of those have down arrows next to them right now so that is not a problem that is unique to Netflix. There are things on Amazon uh, that I would like to watch offline that I can't. It all depends on the rights they negotiate with the individual content providers. Uh, but you know, before we get into this wider discussion, Scott, uh, does does that matter to you? Does the fact that they just gave us uh, downloading good enough, or or are you going to be clamoring for them to you know strike those deals with everybody? Well, I mean. I don't know, my first impression when we heard about this news this morning, and I found out about it, by the way, sitting on a certain sitting device, <laughs> mm. looking at my phone. I won't say A where. throne of a sort? Sure, perhaps. yeah, it was a nice one. It's a decent one. Mm-hmm. And um, I was looking at app updates and went, oh, Netflix is being updated. What's going on? And usually you click and it says, we're always improving our app or whatever. And this one said, you can now download movies and TV episodes. And I thought, oh, that's in. We're good. We're. I thought I was breaking news a little bit. And then I checked the internet and everybody was talking about it. Um, I'm very excited about it. This is something I really could have used on a recent flight. Uh, I like the idea of being able to go to hotels with sketchy Wi-Fi and know that I've got a good bank of things I want to catch up on uh, when I'm there in the evenings or whatever. So this was already a cool feature uh, in the Amazon Prime app, streaming app. Uh, They implemented that not too long ago. And I felt like this was just a matter of time before it happened. As far as Everybody being involved, Disney's a big player, so that's kind of a ding a little bit, but that's the same sort of ding you feel when, I don't know, another big player won't uh, put Viacom on PlayStation View or some other deal couldn't be struck to make it possible for some other connected uh, you know, service to be part of something else. So Hulu can't get a certain channel or, or only can get one episode per week or whatever. Are um, you going to use this much, though? Yes, I'm going to use this all the time. When are you going to use it? Uh, I'm going to use it. For, well, that's a that's a great question. When will I use it? I mean, I don't travel. That I much. use the Amazon one yeah. when I travel to watch Justified mm-hmm. because we're watching that for Cord Killers. Yeah, and a lot of times that's my come traveling on a weekend, and the weekends usually when I watch that in preparation. So I'm like, oh, I'll take my plane time and 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 watch that. I don't know when I'll use it for if I'll, I'll use it for Netflix. Okay, I just figured out how I'll use it. Thank you for giving me the time to think about it. Here's what I think I'm going to do. I think it's not now. It's later. It's in the spring. But in the spring, I'm very fond of sitting in a hammock during a certain part Mm. of the day. There's a certain part of the day where the sun is not quite hitting me. It's nice and peaceful there. 
quiet. I can sit in that hammock and I usually read or something. Take an hour there or whatever. That'd be a great place to take an iPad Pro or, you know, I don't know, my NVIDIA tablet or something out there and watch something I'd already pre-downloaded because my Wi-Fi signal doesn't reach where I like to have the hammock. So there's one tiny, very exclusive to me use case. But I think a lot of people are going to like this for traveling. If you're in a van full of kids and you're driving to Disneyland and you're coming from Colorado and you got the next 15 hours ahead of you or whatever, having those back there, uh, these tablets back there on the back of seats and running continuously with stuff that you don't have to connect to an internet service or an LTE coverage to get, that's pretty beneficial, I think, uh, in a lot of scenarios. So I think there are a lot of people who will like this. And I think they've certainly probably thought of these use cases, or I'm not sure they would have cared to, to do it at all. Now, today also, uh, DirecTV Now launched in the United States. That's uh, AT&T's over-the-top service, uh, as they call it sometimes, where you can stream television channels uh, for a temporary amount of time. You can get 100 channels for $35 a month. That's that's a discount. It'll go up to like 60 bucks a month later on. Although they will have a $35 a month uh, program or, or package available with only 60 channels a month. So you, you got to get on that now if you want it. They're also giving away Fire TV and Apple TV if you want to prepay for a certain amount of months. They don't have a Cloud DVR. They don't have a Roku app at launch. And it got me thinking when we were like, okay, Netflix just added downloading. So now that's something that I can get from Netflix that I used to only think I could get from Amazon is, is a service where I don't have to prepay for stuff, but I can download it and, list, and watch it offline. DirecTV Now launched. It's got some some cool channels that I can't get from Sling and PlayStation View, but not that many of them. And it doesn't have a DVR yet, but it sure is a lot cheaper. And I started to realize it's not just app fatigue, Scott. We've talked about that before. Like, how many of these services do I have to have? It's what do I want from them? Mm. What do we actually want? We are getting our wish. This is the curse of getting your wish, <laughs> which is like you have control now. You can get what you want, when you want, where you want, on whatever device you want as far as television goes. So how do you want it? Mm. And and do we need one service to provide us everything? Or are we going to be happy com cobbling a few together? And I went through it. I came up with about, I don't know, about eight or nine different reasons, different things you might want from your service. And not everybody's going to want the same things. Sometimes you just want to have something on. DirecTV Now is perfect for that. Like, I just turn on a channel and let it play. Sometimes you want to have something on from a particular genre. DirecTV Now is going to be good for that. They'll have movie channels. They'll have news channels. You want to watch something live while it's being broadcast. DirecTV Now is great for that, right? Okay, so they got, they've got the, well, they don't have CBS, but they've got Fox. So you can watch that NFL game, or you can watch the awards, uh, the Oscars on ABC. But what if you want to watch a specific series? Uh, then, then suddenly, it's like, well, they've got some on-demand. Mm -hmm. I can watch last night's episode of The Voice, mm -hmm. but I can't watch it tonight right after it airs. I have to wait for it to show up on demand because they don't have the DVR. So then PlayStation View is better because they have the DVR, and I can DVR it and start watching it while it's still on. Uh, or you want to watch on a mobile device. Oh, PlayStation View doesn't allow mobile watching outside of your house for some channels that they don't have the agreements with, but, but AT&T and Sling do. So now DirecTV Now and Sling are the better option? You know, it's it's. There's not one option. What are the things that are important to you, Scott? Okay, so for me, it's watch what I want. I mean, these are the basics. Let's talk about the fundamentals. Watch what I want, when I want to watch it, where I want to watch it. I think those are like the, the the holy trinity of cord cutting in this in this era. And as someone who's done this since, gosh, I think I've pulled plug about 2007. It's been a long time for me. I've seen a lot of cool stuff come. A few came that seemed cool that went away. I still miss Aereo in a major way. I loved that service uh, while it existed briefly uh, here in Salt Lake City. But uh, those three things have always mattered the most to me. So you say we're finally getting what we've asked for. We're finally getting what we've wished for. And I'm not so sure about that because I think what we've ultimately wanted and wished for is more of an a la carte, I'm going to a buffet of sorts sort of solution and at that buffet, I can have a little of this and a little of that and a little of that. And for a reasonable price, I can have... Well, I would argue you have that. Mm. You can have a little of Netflix. You can have a little of Amazon. You can have a little of Hulu. Mm. What you can't do is the old-fashioned a la carte. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, and that's what you I mean. You can't say, I just want Sci-Fi Channel, <laughs> ESPN, and Bravo. Right. Because I'm odd. Right. <laughs> that's a, a it's really not what I want. Nice I combo. Yeah, I was going to say, a pretty yeah. good random pick. But I... You're right. You're right. But 
that I think is still the holy grail. Like at some point where I can say, give me ABC, give me Fox, give me Di Discovery, and give me Sci-Fi. Thanks, I'm good. Uh, and then have me pay a reasonable price for that is a thing that's not happening yet. And but do you really want those channels, or do you want certain shows off those channels? Well, and that's that's a really good point. If we want to go another layer more granular, then yes, the answer is I do just want the shows I want. Um, because you could already do that. You know that very well, right? Mm -hmm. You can just go and get a Voodoo or an iTunes pass and, and buy the season. Yeah, or go to Amazon and do the same thing. Exactly. That And that is what I do for a lot of stuff. The problem is my my buffet is almost like it's not a nice clean buffet with sort of easy selection and a nice guy cutting beef over here. And this area is for desserts. It's not organized like that. It's like 18 restaurants all mashed together and all fighting for my business. And it's they're like, all it's like those, those food marketplaces. I went to one in Seoul where they've like, they've got a nice indoor place over here, but then there's a guy that's just serving squid from a bucket <laughs> over here. And it's, it's like, you know, you got to get your, your cast beer on, on this, this aisle because it's a little cheaper, but then you, you want to pick up your tomato gnocchi stuff or whatever over there. Like right, it's, right. it's all over the place. Right. You're totally right. And that's, that's a problem for me because what you're now saying to me is, Hey, I want Westworld and Game of Thrones. That's two items I want from a channel that I, I you know, there's other good stuff on there, but I'm, I'm good if I don't have all the rest. Uh, I may want something in the future. They may put something out on the table and say, how about this? You want to eat this? And I'd say, well, sure, HBO, that sounds great. But no matter what, I'm paying 15 bucks to them, no matter what I want. And if I just get the one show, it's 15 bucks. If I get eight shows, I'm still paying 15. That's a better deal because I'm getting eight shows. But if I don't care about those other shows, it's not as all a card as I'd like to be. I wouldn't mind it if I could just say, here's a i don't know uh, enough space like let's say you get you get 50 slots and in those 50 virtual slots i can fill each slot with a show i want and i can swap out shows anytime i want for something else but I can only ever have 50 in there at any given time when somebody comes up with a service like that and gives me my one through 50 and i can just say you know sick of this food network show swipe it out and swipe in i don't know shark tank or something uh, and I keep moving on my merry way and I'm still just paying whatever I pay per month for that 50 slaughter that I can swap in and out. Man, that's the grail. That's where I want to be. That is when I know I have chosen wisely, as they said in and Indiana Jones. Someone, and Brian Brushwood has called for this uh, forever on Cord Killer. Someone to come up with an interface where you just say, these are the things I want to watch. These are the kind. These are the live channels I want access to. Uh, these are the sports I follow. These are the shows I love. Tell me what to subscribe to, and then when those shows are over, and I don't, and they, and if it's the only thing on that service, cancel that service. Tell me if it makes more sense to get Hulu to access a show, or to get Sling to access a show, or to buy a season pass for that show. Right, like somebody creating that kind of meta service right now. Uh, I don't know if they would make any money is the problem, but it would certainly be used by a lot of people. And it only works if somebody's got central control over all the content we're talking about. So my slotting in of 50 shows depends entirely upon the content creators, their owners and producers being willing to make the deals that make the 50 slot possible in the first place. So because we're still dealing with all these things, you just described three very comparable services that one's missing this, the other has this, but it's missing that. And most of the things they are either missing or don't have yet are because of these deals. Even the Netflix can't download Disney stuff is because of deals not being able to be struck, which may be beneficial or not to Netflix. I don't know with Disney, but uh, it doesn't matter. The details don't matter. To me as an end user, those are restricting. And until those go away, and they're not going to, when are they going to? There's never going to be a consolidation where the entire entertainment slash content world comes together and says, we are now the one single central hub for all things that are made ever because I don't think we want that either. We want diversity. Yeah. We want, you no, know, well, all that. Well, but what we do want is this shakeout to finish, right? Right right now, we're still in that early awkward translation from there was one service that gave you everything the way they wanted you to view it. <laughs> right? Yeah. You could you could maybe DVR stuff, but mostly you were restricted to watching things the way cable wanted you to. But you got everything, right? You could, mm -hmm. you know, you could spend $120 a month and get all the channels. Uh, we're we're going from that to like, hey, guess what? There's a Netflix out there, and that isn't available on your your cable, uh, unless you've got an X1 box from Xfinity. Uh, you you have to pay for that separately. Hulu is out there with some originals now that we're with we, it. We've broken the model, but we haven't come up with a efficient second model. And I, I don't think it's impossible that down the road you won't you'll be able to say, you know what? 
we finally gotten rid of all of these old entanglements, these old deals, these old rights. Disney has decided whether they're going to operate their own service or not. And everybody knows, like, you're the service providers, you're the content creators, and here's what you do. And it becomes simpler anyway. Yeah, for sure. Simplicity is the next step. And I don't know what has to happen. Um, I mean, look, we're, we are in a bit of a embarrassment of riches period. And it's real good right now. Like when I did this back in 07, my options were ridiculously limited. I think Netflix may have just announced they were going to do something. I was going antenna and then some really crappy early stuff on Netflix. And it was website only and it was Windows only. And it was, uh, I don't even think they supported Chrome back then. Like like a really weird time for, for that stuff. But I was happy to do it and I was excited about it. And I saw the future of it a little bit or at least glimpsed it. And here we are today with some really concrete methods to get what I absolutely would have loved back in 07. I would have killed for any of these three services we're talking about. Um, but I just feel like the stakes are higher because now that we're there, we can almost see it. We can almost smell the end. We can see what's possible. And if the deals can just be struck right and the right service can happen, the problem is, once again, you know, we're looking for the perfect service. Well, everybody wants to be that perfect service because that's where the money's going to be. So everybody's going to compete for it. I want competition. But we're just, it's always going to be five or six places trying to do it. How will that ever solve the licensing problem? That's really the big hurdle here. And don't forget, my buffet idea, while a nice little metaphor, doesn't actually work. Because at buffets, when you go in there, it's never the same thing week to week. This week they had seafood. That's out of season now. Nobody's bringing seafood. What do you got instead? Prime rib. It changes. I'm cool with that because I'm just there to eat. That doesn't really translate to what we're talking about. I can't be like, oh, we're not going to get Game of Thrones this year because uh, this company thinks it's out of season. So instead... Well, usually the problem with a buffet is that, that you know, it's, it's not freshly made for you to order, right? It's right. The beef's been sitting there all day and it's a little dry. I don't know if that metaphor translates or not. Maybe there is. Yeah, the more we talk about it, the worse my metaphor gets. However, <laughs> not unusual for me. Um, but yeah, the, the, the day where I can just say, give me that, 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 and that, and I will pay you a fair price for those things. Again, what that is, I don't know. I, I, I admit that that's an arbitrary assignment at this point. And maybe it's 34 a month for 100 channels, at least for the first three months. Or maybe it's whatever, you know. I, I, I think we're going to see we're going to see a, a proliferate. We are going to see. I don't even think. We are going to see a proliferation of these services. Hulu's going to come with one. YouTube's going to come with one. I think we're going to see what the weaknesses are, what people actually want to pay for those services and and why they want to use them. And it's going to shake out and new licensing agreements are going to form based on what consumers want. And, and I think over the long term, consumers always prevail. They, you always get what people actually want. It's just a matter of how long the industry takes to give up their old ways of making money and lean into them. And if they can control more aspects of it, which they can with video, it takes longer. That's why it's taking longer here than it did with music. Yeah. Don't let us down, future Unplugging Hollywood. We're counting yeah. on you over here. All right. We got a few messages uh, related to our discussion of zero rating yesterday. Jeremy from Winter is Coming, Ottawa, said, I enjoyed your discussion. I work as a software developer for Internet routers, but I'm also a subscriber to Internet service, of course. So I see both sides of this discussion. I wish that ISPs would move to a model where best effort bulk data was just uncapped. I should be able to designate some traffic as high priority, and I'd be willing to pay for usage of that kind of traffic. I think this better reflects the economics of the network where bulk bits are essentially free, but delivering real-time audio, gaming traffic, or video requires something better than bulk treatment. The pessimist in me knows this won't work because one, can we make a UI for the average person to control which bits are bulk and which are high priority? And do they even want to manage that? I do, I do, but they probably don't. The ISPs will make sure that bulk bits will perform bad enough that you will have to use high priority to do something like watch Netflix. But maybe we wouldn't stream so much and instead download and watch later, now that we can. Uh, and the next Internet of Things botnet DDoS attack will designate its traffic as high priority. It suddenly piles of people have Internet bills and thousands of dollars. Uh, so, yeah, there have to be ways of doing that. But I, I'm intrigued by this as a more natural way of monetizing to say, hey, you guys, we're not going to zero rate. You're going to prioritize. We'll deliver all of your data without a cap if you want. But if there's a service that you want to prioritize, we'll let you prioritize that to your router. Uh, and and it, 
it sounds like a horrible idea when you just put it like that because obviously the ISPs then start striking deals and try to encourage you to prioritize certain things or they slow down certain services to make you pay them to prioritize, like he said. Uh, but there might be some safeguards you can put in place to make that work. I am going to just take a moment here and remind everybody how smart I think many of your listeners are. All your listeners oh, are smart. Sure. But this Absolutely. is an incredible, yeah. incredible email that really makes a bunch of good points. First of all, a great idea. And second of all, a lot of pitfalls that could come from that idea. Um, all that being said, it makes perfect sense to me. I just ran into a problem with my own ISP. I won't mention names, but they're getting all over me for hitting a certain level that I shouldn't be hitting. And I thought, what has changed? Like, I haven't done anything different. I'm not, I'm not suddenly doing 18 more shows. I don't have some huge reason why I would have any greater incoming or outgoing traffic here. So I did a little Nick's bit. Nick's not running a BitTorrent server in <laughs> no, the garage. Not that I know of. Plus, they have their own ISP upstairs for this very oh, reason. Well, so that they're sucking yeah. off a whole other uh, thing. So in my case, um, I did a little digging around. And what it turned out to be is I have a Backblaze account. And I have a folder where every day for every show I record, there's about a gig and a half to two gigabyte, um, or excuse me, almost a terabyte of video for every show I do. Oh, wow. Not a terabyte. It's probably closer to, I don't know what I was going to say, that's a lot. It's maybe yeah. 500 so, gigs so or something. In other something. words, this backup is, is, is uploading. It's uploading every time. So what's yeah. happening is I've got this huge folder that is uploading every time I put up a new video or that I have one just sitting there. And I don't ever need it to. It's all temporary until I put them on YouTube and then I'm done. I delete them. But it still took the time to upload those and eat up all this data. It would be really cool. Well, first of all, I have now gone and designated what folders not to do this with. This is a thing I can do with Backblaze. But it would be really cool on that next level to say, yeah, I want gaming traffic to be treated as high priority. I want Skype traffic to be treated as high priority. Anything dealing with video, uh, up uploading video would be really nice to have that prior high priority. But I don't care about web browsing speed so much as, uh, as to say it needs to be priority. But his points down here make a lot of sense. And... I don't know what it is with your listeners. They're also drinking smart drinks or something because that's he's well. A, a lot dude. of them actually work in positions that that directly affect how all of this works. We we got an anonymous person wrote in and said, you know what? In the last four months or so, the number of players for wholesale fiber in the U.S. has basically halved. This will increase the price of internet for people who don't buy from the big guys and is one of the major problems with zero rating and the like. Uh, today, ELI got bought by Zayo. Or Zio, uh, not companies most people have heard of, but it removed one of the final independent fiber companies from the ground. Ugh. So suddenly you've got people saying, hey, you want to transit your data upstart Netflix competitor? Great. You have to pay us. Also, you have to pay us again to uh, get zero rating for your customers because otherwise they're all going to watch AT&T's products because we zero rate them. Mm. You know, none of the, I mean, I'm not trying to be conspiratorial, but did this I wonder if any of this has to do with Google's slowdown on their fiber rollout. I don't know. Like maybe the fiber's uh, not there? I don't know. That's a good question. Mm. It's not obviously, I mean, Google has a lot of money, right? right. Uh, it's not obvious that that would be why. They also owned a lot of their own dark fiber, but uh, it, I'm, I'd be curious how that plays into it. Yeah. Uh, and then Mink said, your coverage of determining the veracity of news sources gave me an idea. Do you know of a plugin or extension, ideally for Firefox or Chrome, that comes with a pop-up message of my own writing whenever I visit a website I've designated? Even a simple reminder that this is the onion, remember to laugh, <laughs> would be useful on those days where you're just tired or doing five other things and maybe not focusing on the article you're kind of paying attention to. Maybe even better would be a message that comes up before saying, this is a junk site. Don't even bother give them, giving them your money by visiting. Maybe it's just me, but if I write the note and specify the website myself, it seems like there'd be a number of uses for such a tool. Mm, very nice. Lifehacker talked about something called the BS detector, which uh, kind of uh, was interesting to read through. You guys may want to go look at that as well. But uh, I love the idea of little reminders, uh, little tricks like this. The more automated, the better. My big trick is, or the only trick I really use is, is the headline of the thing I'm looking at a question? If it's a question, I immediately go into way more i need to know more about this mode because i don't think i trust the question always answer no yeah always answer and then no decide if you're still interested because it's things like does jeff bezos know that he's and you're like mm, something no. fishy here uh no he's not so yeah, but he's i not. like this idea of an extension that i could customize so that you know when i hit a particular site it reminds me like hey 
the, this is not a site you know, you know, take a moment because not everybody really wants to concentrate as hard as we do on the things that we read. Yeah, yeah. There are a couple of actual Chrome browser plugins just to kind of give them an answer to this that are for this very thing. Well, they're not for this thing, but if you if you go and you find a site that is flagged in this uh, extensions database as a source of fake news, it will tell you. And if yeah, it's not, see, he it wants won't. something that he controls. Exactly. And I think that's interesting. It's almost like like Rabbit Badger, uh, private. I'm sorry, Privacy Badger. P- Rabbit Badger is a fine Twitter person that I follow. <laughs> Privacy Badger, uh, except for for news quality, where you could just set these these you know yellow, red, or green uh, with your own customized notices. Yeah. It's interesting. I think interesting I would prefer stuff. his method too. I wanna I want to make my own determinations. I realize that. It's good sometimes to have everybody's input on things and know what stuff is, but also I'm also relying on a database that I don't control, so I don't know if all of this information yeah. is correct. So it's a good email. Well, thank you, Scott Johnson, uh, and thank you for being here. What do you got going on to tell folks oh, about? Oh, I don't know. Uh, just trying to fulfill orders from Cyber Monday and Black Friday. So that went really well. Thank you, everybody, who went to uh, my store and is a, uh, a patron otherwise of what I do. If you'd like to follow what I'm up to, all my projects and shows and stuff can be found over at frogpants.com. And as always, if you want to chat with me online, I, I reply to people a lot on Twitter, at Scott Johnson on Twitter. Uh, thank you to everybody who supports this show. There are loads of ways to do it. To do it. Head into the holidays, if you want to buy somebody a mug or a T-shirt that says DTNS on it, uh, head to dailytechnewsshow.com slash store. Uh, all the ways to support us are at dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. And, of course, our main way of funding the show is Patreon, patreon.com slash DTNS. Jack Conti and those folks are amazing, uh, and we appreciate everything they do. Uh, big thanks to all of our patrons, new and old, including Omega Follis, if that's your real name, <laughs> Nick Pizzo and Shinari Smith, uh, and and even uh, listeners like Sakani Wright, who writes a regular column at DailyTechNewsShow.com. In fact, he just put up a new post called from his Your Private Driver series about the changes that have been made to the Uber and Lyft apps uh, and things. So if you're interested in a ride-sharing perspective from the driver's side, check out DailyTechNewsShow.com for that. Finally, we need to know What story do you think is the most underrated of the year? What story do you think, gosh, you know what? Everybody talks about the Note 7 when they're talking about 2016. I think this is a better story to talk about. Send it to us. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com with the subject line, underrated. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv. And our website is dailytechnewsshow.com. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) Done and done. Dusted and done. Done and dusted. Dunstan. Sean Dunstan. Do you, you usually run video a little longer to get post show stuff, right? I do. Because I can because I can record I can keep I haven't stopped the video recording. I can keep that going for as long as you want. Okay. So you just say um, the word and I'll um, Yeah, let's let's figure out uh show title first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just wanted you to know then, I haven't stopped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we can figure right. out that. So hey. many things. Hi Roger. Hello. Hey, How Roger. are you? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. That I'm good. so used to uh, things um, <laughs> in Chrome. Surprise, surprise. All right, Showbot. Showbot. My team. <laughs> Shane. What Shane said. Breaking. Johnson makes futile call for journalist restraint. <laughs> <laughs> um, the internet, A. Come on back, beep. Come on back, beep. Oh yeah, for your for your data backup. Oh, got it, get it. Beep, because you're back, backing up beep. your data with the truck. Get it, get it. Back it's good. Up, beep. It's pretty good. Uh, Netless flicks. Mm. Oh, I found another. By the way, another good use case. Just real quick, you got a house with limited bandwidth, and your kids want to watch a movie, but you want to do something that needs uh, full ah, bandwidth. You but you're you're streaming your your show boop. Yeah, and yes, <laughs> and then they can download it ahead of time and watch it then. <laughs> There you go. My use case scenario is in the car. So you get the stuff. Yeah. 
Yeah. No, I thought of you when Scott was bringing that up because yeah, I know that's a, a that's one for you. One. Oh one. yeah, uh, Captain Canuck in the Wayback Machine. Okay. Uh, Ice Road backup truckers. Scott does metaphors. <laughs> archiving the internet up north. Netflix hey, and go chill elsewhere. <laughs> hey, hey, good looking. We'll be back to pick your bites up later. That's not bad either. Uh, the truck ones are amazing. Canada gets truckloads of internet. Archiving the net under America's hat. You, the one comma Neo, uh, the squid oh. from a from a bucket bundle. Beatmaster says not using Wi-Fi to watch Netflix helps with battery life. Oh, good point. Yeah, that's Amazon. true. That's true. Amazon keeps on, tr- I guess, trucking, but they spelt it trunking. I guess they meant trucking, right? Yeah. Are they are they trying to make a pun about trunk lines? Could Maybe. be. I, uh, Amazon cloud trucking. It's the elephant in the room. <laughs> Get it? Oh, I see. He did two. Another J. Martin did two. Oh, one okay. is keeps on trunking. The other ones keep on trucking. Yeah, oh, I see. Uh, sneaker net, but trucks. I like that one too. Is it sneaker net? At that time, it's tire, tire, tire net. Um, Gooligan's Island. <laughs> I mean, that just how can you not? You got to You got to submit that one. That one's pretty good. Uh, hack your car at your own risk. Netflix flicks, mobile Netflix and chill. Throne flicks. But if you're on the throne, wouldn't you already? Whatever. Uh, this is broken. Mine is broken. Smelling the end of cable. Forty bits in a mule. <laughs> you need a truthiness plugin. The pants on fire plugin. Uh, breaking Johnson makes you tell all for journalist restraint is at the top. <laughs> yeah, but they we're not you can't use that one. I love it, but yeah, it's not really It's not really the show. It's not really part of the show, really, is it? Not really. Mm, well, I mean, when we were talking about the fake news email, I guess it was, but Yeah, I mean, it That's was, not the main point of the show. Mm. I think Netflix, Netless Flix, I could go with one of the trucker ones. Ice Road Backup Truckers. Come on back beep. <laughs> it's funny. Ice I like Road Netless Backup Flix. You like Netless Flix? Yeah, it's very succinct. My favorite is Netflix and go chill somewhere else, but I don't, I, I don't, I wouldn't blame you for not using it. I just wanted it to be said that that one's my favorite. All right. That made me laugh. Well, I am exporting now. So what are we picking, Roger? Netless Flicks. Netless Flicks it is. Da, da, da. Sorry, Scott. No, it's like assless chaps. I'm, I'm in. It's good. Yeah. Although, you know, well, really, if you think yeah. about chats, aren't they always sort of assless? It's like, it's kind of redundant to say. I agree. It's like saying uh, Ass full chaps? short, short, <laughs> short shorts or something. That's it. That's, isn't that an English phrase? Did you say ass full, pa- <laughs> ass full chaps? <laughs> wow. Although, you know, assless chaps does sound like a, a nice street party. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. We park in the driveway. We drive on the parkway. Who knows? I don't know how this They walk in the pavement. That's right. You pay in the Walkman. (laughs) (laughs) You run with a Walkman. Yeah, pay with your... your, (laughs) your So wait, where's the video coming from, Tom? Uh, Uh, Me. So I need to put this like either Dropbox it or post it directly to your YouTube channel or however you want me to do it. But it's ready just to be like thrown to your YouTube. Yeah, you know what? Uh, because of the extenuating circumstances today, uh, I'm going to say let's go ahead and stop our video stream so that you can can then put that somewhere.